We call this Brown's greenhouse. From Hal Brown, who gives us the land to use. Hal, Hal and Alice Brown have let us use the land to have this greenhouse and this stuff for a long time now, more than 20 years. In some ways, as you can tell, there's no sign outside, there's peace seeds, there's no, you know, uh, the same thing, uh, a lower profile with a higher productivity is more to our sense about what matters. Bringing the people behind our food to life. How do we end up with a greenhouse that looks like this, that has filled with uh, avocados, jujubes, kumquats, and hundreds of other kinds of plants. In 1994, this greenhouse was built. It's 16 foot tall, it's 30, uh, 96 foot uh, long, and it's 30 feet wide. And so we had a big empty greenhouse, and we tilled it with a rototiller. And you said, what are you gonna plant in a big empty greenhouse? And we have been interested in the structure of biodiversity. We call it kinship gardening. Like, why don't we plant those plants that are related to one another together? And then, like all the daisies, there are 25,000 daisies. Why don't we plant reps of the daisies, but there's 1,200 genera. How many can you collect? So collect a bunch of daisy genera and plant them all together to see how they fit. Daisies, oh, and they're related to carrots, umbels, and they're related to tomatoes and potatoes, solanaceae, and they're related to the borages, and they're related to the... Uh, mints and they're related to the verbenas and so as you begin to take the whole world flora and look for representatives of it so you can actually make a garden to take a look at the structure of diversity in your own hands you can't plant it all but you can plant the right reps to take a look at what it looks like so we decided okay let's do that in this greenhouse so that's what we did we planted 500 different kinds of plants laid out phylogenetically it's called or a kinship layout and uh so when we walk through it, we will look at some aspect of the remnants of when we did that in the beginning. At the same time, some of the trees that we planted, which were in gallon pots or a pot this big with a plant that big, have turned into big plants of all sorts of kinds. And so at the same time, uh, Delana and Mario, peace seedlings, came along and decided, why don't we plant a lot of citrus, since we found out that the Meyer lemon that we have been growing makes the two plants that we have of Meyer lemons, which are old trees now, maybe 15, 20 years old, they make a thousand or more fruits every year. So wow, we have lemons, what else can we do? So they said, oh, well, why don't we try kumquats? So this is maybe eight years old, this kumquat. It was in a pot this big, and now it made a huge amount of kumquats uh, this last winter. So this is a mixture, this greenhouse, of uh, a phylogenetic garden, which I should also point out. In 97, I think 98, we had floods. The water came up to here or to here. Some of it lasted for a week or 10 days. And 350 species of the original ones we planted died. So we also ended up with a Darwinian experiment of changing the environment, having flood situation, and watching what lived through it and actually thrived. And it turned out to be citrus. So here it is. We start growing citrus as curiosity for a phylogenetic, for a kinship garden. We find out that they survive flooding. And then we realize that California's got a drought going on and citrus culture's in trouble in California and means we don't have to bring citrus from California, we can grow them in greenhouses in Oregon and on the Pacific Northwest. As the temperature gets warmer and as it moves up, these are ways to change the agricultural potentiality from big chemical monocultures that we have in the Willamette Valley to greenhouses filled with edible food plants that uh, usually have to be shipped in. So it's a different approach to saying, how do we make a sustainable society where the food is organic, is healthy, is in diversity, and is local? So putting all the pieces together, this is like an experiment that now, from 1994, so this is 21 years, we're looking at a 21-year experiment, right? This was not funded by the government, the university, private institutions, no, it was just a bunch of people, mostly hippies, who actually devoted themselves to making a greenhouse that could do something interesting in terms of what we can do in our lives to make a better world. 
So that's as an introduction to what this garden is we'll walk through. But this was the monocots, and then uh, other things get planted in the monocots, but this is not, they're not flowering anymore. Bird of Paradise, that's in the monocots. The bananas are in the monocots, and crinum, oh, there's a good one right here. Oh, we almost got a Bird of Paradise flower. There's one left, just to get an idea. So the Bird of Paradise flower is related to bananas, it's related I said that, to gingers, and gingers, zingiberts. Those are important because turmeric, an interesting discovery about turmeric, which is an a, a orange root, rhizomatous root, uh, is that cucurmin is a molecule in turmeric, pretty limited, and that is converted to a 22 carbon long fatty acid that makes up the white matter of our brain. And that's where most of the memories are stored. So if you want to get better memory, grow yourself some turmeric. You can actually do it if you have a heating pad that you use to germinate seeds, you can put some turmeric on it all so it has warmth all, all summer and all winter, and you get nice big things in pots. So if I said to grow turmeric, even though it's a semi-tropical, tropical plant. But it's part of the issue about these things we didn't know about the memory and the images in the brain until we, and that it's connected to the food we eat. So it's, it's relevant uh, to uh, grow and eat more stuff that keeps us intelligent, keeps us able, thinking, uh, aware, perceptive, and devoted to making a world that's good for everybody. That was partly why we did this. We wanted to do something interesting that we could discover what would be worth doing which is to grow and collect a lot of kinds of plants and put them in some kind of biological order. This is a Bocarnia. This is a ponytail palm. Well, they started off 20 years ago in a pot like this. It was a little smaller, actually. And we planted it in the ground. And now this is 20 years later. And look what happened to it. The cats like to sleep on one side of it. Uh, you can sit on it. If you want to read a book, you can sit yourself down and lean against it and then look up and see, wow, this is a, another kind of uh, planting. We don't like to plant things in benches, in pots. We see that most of the health of the plants depend on being in the ground, and so the more we can actually put stuff in the ground, we do that. So we talked a little bit about monocots. Then the rest of this was mainly dicots means when, when the seed sprouts, you get two leaves first, the monocots, you get one, seed, one leaf first. It's a bit of peculiar because if you look at conifers, like a pine tree that makes five or six little seed, uh, leaves first, and it's not called a polycot, it's called a conifer. So the names are obscure, but what the point is that uh, we started planting the dicots. This is uh, the first try at planting a mango. It looks like we got, this is, the tree's only a couple feet tall, it's got little fruits on it already. So it looks like we can probably grow mangoes. Until you do it, you don't know. But, so what are the dicots that we, they're over there, uh, let's see what I got, let me go over there. This is a pomegranate. So Delana and Mario were interested in pomegranates, looks like one's pollinated there. They don't pollinate very well so far, so, but they wanted to grow pomegranates, so they grew five kinds of pomegranates in the greenhouse. And then this is a daisy, this is yacon. This is a, well, the yacon, we're talking about nutrition, and yacon from South America, grown for thousands of years. The leaves are used to suppress, can make a tea that suppresses blood sugar spikes for people who have diabetic problems. And the root has inulin polymers, which are polymers of glucose and fructose, and you can make a syrup out of them, uh, which is easier to make in high concentration sits on the shelf, yacon syrup. And also, when in Australia, they analyzed for the glycemic index of yacon syrup, it was one. Now, agave syrup, uh, oh, the, yeah, the agave syrup is, 30, is, no, is 15 or 18, and fructose is 35. So this has very low glycemic index with something with sugar. And this is the best sweetener that we found on the earth so far that has sugars in it that uh, so it has some other things that reduce the problem with insulin. So this is an old food plant from South America. It's a dicot too. Uh, and this is an Andean carrot. Yeah, this is aracacha. This is the Andean carrot. Is it actually make a carrot it, that we would be familiar with? No, it makes a root with about six or eight carrots coming out of a central crown. 
and they're very tasty, very delicious. And it, there are, what, 40,000 hectares of this grown in Brazil. It's not like a minor food plant. You can break off one of these and then re-root it. So one of these will turn into a whole big cluster and each one will have roots. And so the whole thing will surround itself with roots this big to that big to that long. Very delicious, very interesting. We see that a lot of the food plants that we would like to grow, you need the germplasm, you need the skill, and then all of a sudden you end up with new foods in your life, like the Indian roots, yacon, oka, mashua, malka, aracacha. These are all root vegetables. And it seems that our society has drifted to an attitude where grains are going to be the sustaining food source. And we see that we, we would rather that roots begin to become, uh, there's something about why growing so much grains on huge monocultures is doing to us. And uh, anyway, we've been curious about what other root plants we could grow here and how they would do. And we started growing yacon in 1990. And now it's 20 years some later, and it's just beginning to be recognized as a good vegetable and a useful food in this country because it takes a generation to be interested in new things usually. In 1987, I think it was, the National Academy of Sciences published a book on the lost crops of the Incas. They said this was the, the rarest of the food plants in, uh, of the mountains of South America. And it's called Malca. It's in the four o'clock family. And it makes big, gnarly, interesting, great tasting roots. They're like a cross between a beet and a potato. Nothing like it. So it took us 20 years to get some seed. And we were grateful somebody put some seeds in a pack and sent it to us from England. And we've been able to grow it up and now we have it as a food plant. So here, really right on the corner here, you have Malka, you have sugar cane, and you have Yacon right there. Two Andean roots. And where does sugar cane come from? Uh, Philippines, does it come from? How hot does it generally get in here? I mean, do you keep a certain temperature or? Only above 35 degrees during the winter. Or the rest, we open the windows, we have a couple fans, but you know, it gets to be 130, 140 up there. Doesn't matter. The citrus doesn't mind it. If they do, they don't seem they to don't be bothered at all, right? They seem to be pretty okay. The avocados don't seem to matter. How did you keep it above 35? Do you? We have a gas heater, natural gas heater, hooked up to the grid. That's the only time during the, the winter when it's real cold. That's that right. Dur during the winter, it's mainly the heat is the cost. And it might be maybe $500 during the winter to uh, turn on and off. It also turns out if it's 40 degrees in here and you come in and you want to work, you turn on the heater and it gets to be 55, 60. And, it's, and also during the winter, you, it's, it's uh, you know, 28 outside, sunny, it's 75, 80 in here. So this place is a greenhouse and it's got two sheets of plastic so it's inflated so it has some insulation over the whole surface. It works very well that way. What is it about your greenhouse here that makes it very different from many other, at least what I've seen grown in other greenhouses. Part of it is most of the stuff we grow is planted in the ground. If you think about those other greenhouses, most of the stuff is in pots on, on tables or on racks of some kind. The other part is most people are, don't interest, they are interested in commercial production of, of starts or vegetables, or, and so they reproduce the same thing again and again and again and again. The other day we went to uh, one of these commercial outlets and they had geraniums and they had, you know, pink, purple, red, orange, yellow, variegated, you know, huge amounts, but all the same, just geraniums, right? And they, so monoculture goes on in the agricultural, horticultural industry. We're interested in biodiversity. So we're planting a greenhouse that has as much biodiversity as we can because we want to just even look, what is biodiversity? What's a genus? It's not an intellectual wrap. It's those plants so closely related that the, this, there's many species, varieties of them all fit together in the next part. And that part fits with the next part. And that part, I mean, it's getting used to the fact that it's one part fits inside another part that we all fit inside. We're, we're a planet. We live in a galaxy. The galaxy is in a, uh, in a Virgo cluster, which has the, the whole immense uh, a Lanaya K, a super galactic cluster as part of, and at the end of that, and we're over here, there's this 
called the great attractor, that when you look at all the galaxies in which direction they're moving in the, in the known universe, most of them are moving towards this thing called the great attractor. Nobody has any idea what it is. It's like the major discovery. It's like discovering DNA inside our bodies and figuring out, oh, the genetic material is true for all the organisms we know. All of a sudden, we find this activity going on in the big cosmos that we just find out, oh, we're a little speck over here. Can we actually clean up the planet, plant more diverse greenhouses, gardens, save native species, grow stuff organically, and let everybody put their hands in trying to make a few new tomatoes or a few new kinds of corn that adapts to their particular ecosystem or their backyard. So that's, I think it's different because we focus on diversity and most greenhouses don't.